gave a list of the 10 most valuable things in life. First, he says family. Secondly, he says faith and patience. Thirdly, he says a small group of friends. Fourth, he says a career based on passion and not pressure. Fifth, he said a collection of good books. Six, he said, childhood memories. Seventh, he says, lifetime experiences. Eighth, he says, gratitude and being content. Ninth, he says, the ability to love, forgive, and to live in the present. And then tenth, he said, a proper or positive attitude towards life. Again, those are, in his mind, uh, the ten most valuable things in life. We may ask you tonight, what is the most valuable thing to you? Jesus says in the long ago, what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall he give in exchange for his soul? Every soul has its beginning with God. In Genesis 2 and verse number 7, the Bible says, And God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Ezekiel 18 and verse 4 says, Behold, all the souls are mine. The souls of the Father as well as the souls of the Son is mine. And he says, The soul who sins shall die. In Ecclesiastes 12 and verse number 7, Solomon says, Then shall the, then shall the body shall return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. A God values souls. Uh, the Bible says in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 and 5, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman and made under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Peter was saying, 1 Peter 2 and verse number 25, For you are like she have gone astray, but have now returned the shepherd and overseer of your soul. Again, we can go on and on tonight showing you the importance that God values souls. And I believe if God values souls, I believe we should value the same thing tonight. His will needs to become our will. What he values should thus become what we value. And Acts chapter 2 and verse number 40, Peter says, save yourselves from this untoward generation. Peter is preaching to an audience uh, that just found out they killed Jesus. They, they had just found out they were the ones with wicked hands that had killed the Messiah. Imagine you are in that crowd and you hear these men begin preaching. Uh, you hear this commotion and different men begin speaking in different languages. And you begin hearing those men, you begin hearing one of those men preach in your language. And these men utter the words, again, that, are, that we're still uh, listening to today. Peter and those apostles said, save yourselves, save your souls from this untoward generation. Now, again, out of all of those people who were there on the day of Pentecost, millions were there. It's as if God looked down out of heaven and God only saw you and God only saw your soul. And God is saying, don't look to the person to the right or to the left. You God is saying to you, you do whatever you have to do to save your soul. Again, Christ says, what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? The Bible not only talks about you, but it shows that there is you in the midst of others. And the Bible says you have an obligation again to save your own soul. Christ will say on another occasion in Matthew chapter 7, there is a broad way, but don't you go after that. That way leads to destruction and many be which go in thereat because there is a narrow way, a straight gate that leads to life in few. Uh, make sure you're one of them uh, that find it. There you stand in the midst of millions of people and it's you and God. And it's as if God is looking at you directly and God says, save your soul. Paul will say, I beg you, brethren, that you present yourselves a, 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 a reasonable sacrifice unto God. Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2. He goes on to say, but from your reasonable service, Paul says, don't be conformed to the world. 
Don't be, you'll lose your soul if you're like everybody else. Peter and the apostles said, save yourselves from the generation that you are in. Again, the word save means to deliver. Peter wants you to deliver your soul from the generation you, found your, you find yourself in. Now, the thing of interest tonight is no one can save their own soul. No one has enough righteousness to save themselves. And so thus, you need someone to save you. We have Jesus. In John 14, verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Peter says, if you want to save your soul, you have to go through Jesus. If you want to be free from your sins, you have to go through Jesus. With all those people who were there on the day of Pentecost, uh, the Bible says only 3,000 souls obey the gospel. Uh, you have millions who are there. You have millions who are listening to this message. And the Bible says out of those millions, only a few, 3,000, decided to change or decided to make uh, their life of Jesus. Many may say, well, preacher, save myself from what way? I thought Jesus saves. He does. Jesus saves, but you must make the choice to surrender to his will in order to be saved. Jesus is not going to force you to be saved. He's not going to force you to be baptized. He's not going to force you to live faithful. You have to make the decision to be faithful to him. And I believe once we make that decision, we realize uh, that it's the best decision we'll ever make. We must make the influence not to be influenced. We must make the decision not to be influenced uh, by what's going on around us. First of all, Peter says, save yourselves from rejecting Jesus. You know, it's almost mind blowing how people distance themselves from Jesus. How people have put space between them and Jesus. If anything, you want to get closer to Jesus. You see, sin, again, according to 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, sin is a transgression. Sin is a violation of the law of God. Sin is separating you from God. We need to get rid of sin so we can draw closer to God. Uh, many don't want to do that, sadly. In Acts chapter 3, uh, Peter said, I know you did it ignorantly. Uh, their leaders was the one that killed Jesus, and they followed in Acts 2, verse 22, down to verse 24, in the preaching of Christ, Peter preaching that great sermon. Peter said, you took him, and with wicked hands, you crucified him. Uh, they did it together. Uh, their leaders led, and they followed. Uh, we may ask you tonight, who are you following? They led, and the people followed them in killing Jesus. You have all the chief priests, you have all the Jews, and they're screaming out, crucify him. And all those Jews followed. And many, the Bible says, knowing they were wrong. Uh, but there were also signs. Pilate's wife said, uh, he's a just man. Herod said, what evil have he done? Pilate said, I find no, he's innocent. I find no fault in the man. They knew he was innocent, yet because they led many Follow them. Uh, our generation, like their generation, is pretty much saying the same thing. Except uh, we add subtle twists uh, that their generation never knew. On the other hand, we'll say things like, well, you can have God, but you don't have to have Jesus. He was just a good man. You, you don't have to have Christ to be saved. That's what our world says today. You, can't, you can have God. But you don't have to have Jesus. And again, John 10 and verse 30, Jesus says, I and my father are one. But our world says, you don't you don't need God. You don't need Jesus. You're fine just how you are. Our world will also say you can have Jesus, but you don't need the Bible. Have the man. Not, you, you, you know what? You don't need his word in order for you to know what his will is. You need his word in order for you to know what you need to do to be saved. You need his revelation. How can man know how to become a Christian if they don't read it in the Bible? They won't become a Christian the way the Bible says. The only thing the Bible is going to produce is a child of God. The Bible cannot produce a denomination. The Bible cannot produce this thing or that thing. The Bible is always going to produce a child of God every single time. Christ was says, you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. John 8, 31, 32. 
He said in John 17, 17, sanctify them through truth. Thy word is truth. Christ said in John 6 and verse 46, why callest me Lord, Lord, and do not the things I say? Our generation says, well, you can be spiritual, uh, but you don't have to be religious. I'm spiritual, but I don't need all of that church. I have God in my heart. Scripture says it doesn't work that way. Jesus is the head of the church, his body. Ephesians 1, 22, 23. You cannot separate the head from the body. It doesn't work that way. You cannot have Jesus and not have his word. In fact, the two go together. You cannot have Jesus and not have his church. And Peter will say, save yourselves from anyone that tells you otherwise. Uh, there you are in the midst of all these people, and they're telling you on some level that you can reject Jesus and you can be just fine. But Peter says, save yourselves from that untoward generation. Naturally, in the text, Peter says, save yourselves from lying. Now, of course, their generation and ours has taken the posture that lying is really no big deal. It's not, it wasn't a big deal in their generation. It's really not one in ours today. Uh, maybe they felt the same way. They hired people to lie on Jesus. Consider that. They hired people to say the man was innocent, to say the man was guilty. And as you progress through the scriptures, uh, the Bible has taken a pretty aggressive, aggressive posture against those uh, that lie. Uh, lying is destructive. In fact, the Bible says, uh, Genesis chapter 3, that the first sin was a lie. Satan lied to Eve. The Bible says he was a murderer from the beginning, John 8, verse 44, and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. I'm always amazed that when people start rating sins, uh, lying just really never makes the list. There are big sins and there are little white lies, we say. The Jews and the Gentiles lied on Jesus. That's how we got to the cross. One of the many ways Pilate said, for envy say he knew they delivered him. He knew they lied to him. Two people in Acts chapter five lost their lives for lying to the Holy Spirit. Our generation now tells us that lie. In fact, you're not cheating if you're not trying. In fact, what do we say? Well, everybody does it. Don't you just love when everybody is included in everything in everything that's wrong? We say, well, you know what, preacher? Everybody does it as if now and let's suppose it is. Everybody does it. There's now a difference between a lie and a liar. Well, everybody does it. It's really not that big of a deal, but it is that big of a deal to God. What if everybody is lying? Does that now make it right? The Bible says, but the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, the whoremongers, the adulterers, and all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire that burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death, Revelation 21, verse 8. And Peter will say, save yourselves from your generation. You see, the devil just delights uh, in the fact of you not surrendering or you not giving your life to God. In fact, the Bible talks about in Ephesians chapter 4, beginning with verse number 26, Paul says, be angry and sin not. In that same context, he talks about, uh, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. But then he also says, don't give place to the devil. The devil is so subtle. The devil is so crafty that the devil will, the devil will have you to believe something that's not found in God's word. Many in our world today has taken the uh, posture by saying God does not judge. Friends, if your God don't judge, you have the wrong God. When you read the book of Genesis, what do you find? God judges. The first seven chapters of the Bible, God judges three times. But let me tell you what happens in the other four. Two of the remaining four, he's making the world. One is a genealogy in chapter six. He says he's going to judge. It just hadn't come until chapter seven. In other words, in making the world two chapters, three of them he's judging, one he decided, and one is a genealogy. If your God doesn't judge, then you haven't read your Bible. Second Peter chapter three, God judges. If you look at Acts chapter 17, 
Paul here is addressing an audience uh, on Mars Hill. Listen to what Paul says when he arrives to Athens on Mars Hills to the philosophers of his day. These individuals were religious. In fact, the Bible says they were very religious. Some translations say they were too religious. There are people who believe they know God, yet they have no idea about the God in heaven. In fact, if it were possible for them two to bump into each other, they still would have no idea who God was. In fact, some people know who God is, and yet they avoid being around God. They have no knowledge of God. And yet our generation says, I'm fine, you're fine, everybody's fine. And in the end, God is going to take us all to heaven. But again, the scripture says the opposite. Beginning with verse number 22 of that 17, Paul says, as he stands in Mars Hill, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious or too religious. For I passed by and beheld your devotions. I found, an, I found an altar with the inscription to the unknown God. Paul says we have so many gods here. Paul says just in case we missed one, oh, we don't want him to feel left out. In verse number 24, Paul immediately attacking their generation. Paul says, God that made the world. Our world today would already disagree. First, degree, they would dis first of all, they would disagree with the first word of the sermon, which Paul says God. Our world says there is no God. Our world says, you know what, everything happened by accident. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Psalm 14 and verse 1, the psalmist said, the fool has said in his heart there is no God. Paul goes on to say the next line, God that made the worlds. Not only... Does he not exist? Our world would say, you know what? He didn't make the world either. Paul would say, God that made the world. Peter would say, save yourselves from a generation that would tell you otherwise. Paul goes on to say he is Lord of heaven and Lord of earth. What that means is God made the world. Later on, Paul is going to say God made you. That means God rules. That means you don't. If you want to get our generation in the uproar, tell them that. Well, you're not in charge. God is. God rules the world and God rules you. If you read the Old Testament prophets, which I'm sure many of you have, among the things that we find, Daniel said, uh, the most high rules in the kingdoms of men. God rules. God is on his throne. God governs the world and all things therein. Paul will go on to say, God that made the world and all things therein. See, and he, God, is Lord of heaven and all of earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. You can't add anything to God for him to be complete. God is already complete by himself. God doesn't need us. We need God. But yet God invites us to be a part of his family. Again, it shows you the love God does have for mankind. People who tell us, well, that's why I'm not coming to worship. I'm not going to go worship God. You know what? You're the one losing out. You're the one missing out on God's blessings. We need him. Paul was saying, verse number 26 of Acts 17, he made us one. The world would tell us we shouldn't love one another. We shouldn't like each other. We should fight. Who tells us that? The people of our generation. God made them one blood, all nations. God gave them purpose in verse number 47, that they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from him. Paul says, seek the Lord and find him. And friends, don't you stop until you do. The man who went and found the treasure in the field, the Bible says he went and sold it. Paul says in Philippians 3, I give all that I might serve Christ. Paul says you have missed out on life if you miss out on God. Many say, well, I'm going to give my life to this thing and that thing and the other. You know, in life, you can accomplish a great deal. You can make a whole lot of money. You can become famous. You can do all of those things. And not saying anything is wrong with those things. But if you do all of that and you don't prepare your soul for the next life, then you have missed everything. You can have everything this side of eternity has to offer. But if you don't prepare your soul for the next life, Paul says it's meaningless. 
Paul says in Philippians, verse, Philippians chapter 3, I have gave all that I might serve Christ. Truth of the matter is everyone is going to die. Everyone is going to die. And most of us already know that. Have you prepared your soul for the next life? You know, we know uh, that is going to end, uh, but we don't know when it's going to end. And so there is an urgency for us to save our souls uh, because we don't know what tomorrow is going to hold. You know, again, many in our world today says, you know what? Uh, God is just some disinterested being separated from humanity. But again, the Bible just doesn't say that. If anything, when you see God's people, what do you see? You see God. Paul will go on to say in verse number 30 of that chapter, uh, Acts chapter 17, uh, 30 and 31, Paul says, At the times of this ignorance God went, that God looked over the top of, but now he commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Verse 31, because he had appointed a day in which he would judge the world in righteousness by that man who he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in him, he hath raised him from the dead. The very man the apostles were preaching, Jesus, uh, is the very one who would judge the world. The very one they rejected is the one who sits exalted, Hebrews 1 verse 3, at the right hand of God. He governs. Again, the Bible says he is Lord of heaven and he is Lord of earth. Christ will say, he that rejected me and received not my word have one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, the same will judge him in the last day. God is going to judge the world by Jesus and our generation tells us you don't need God. You don't need Jesus. You don't worry about lying. You just live your best life. Yet the scriptures are screaming as loud as ever. Save yourself. Save your soul from this untoward generation. Uh, many are saying the church is losing people. Uh, the homes are losing people. It's not so much the church is people not willing to submit their lives to Jesus in their generation. It's people not willing to leave all to follow Jesus. In Matthew chapter 19, Christ addressing that uh, rich young ruler, that the rich young ruler said, all these things have I kept from my youth, though what lack I yet? Christ says, if thou be perfect, go and sell all thy hast. The Bible says the rich man went out and he wept bitterly. Luke 12, verse 15, Jesus says, take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisted not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. God's people are struggling, but you don't have to. God wants you to save your soul from your generation. You see, in the long ago, uh, there are so many cities the apostles go into uh, full of immorality. When you read the book of 1 Corinthians, what do you find? Paul addressing a church who had all these different problems. And Paul says, as a result of you having all those problems, Paul says, you need to repent. In Revelation chapter 3, the Bible talks about John says, uh, I wish that you were cold nor hot. He says, but you're lukewarm, mediocre. He says, I'll spew you out of my mouth. Uh, people are destroyed with guilt. You can save yourselves from guilt. People say, you know what, preacher, no one has ever sinned like me. No one has ever lived as bad of a life I have lived well, Christ will save you and Christ will have you back. Those on the day of Pentecost had just realized they were the ones who killed Jesus. They were the ones with wicked hands who had led him to the cross. And Peter says, save yourself. Here they are on the day of Pentecost and they cry out, what shall we do? Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, Peter, how much is Christ going to forgive? All of it. Peter said you can save yourself from all of that. Peter says, again in Acts 2 and verse number 40, save yourselves uh, from this untoward uh, generation. We might even ask you tonight, what's the most valuable thing to you? Again, as we began, we gave you the man said, these are the 10 most valuable things in life. And not once did he mention his soul. It goes to show us, you know what, you can accomplish a great deal in life. You can do this thing and that thing. But if you don't save your soul, church, it means absolutely nothing. We need to prepare our souls, our lives 
for the world to come. Maybe a million people in the audience or more. It's as if those men looked through the crowd and they saw you. It's as if they were trying to communicate with you in the midst of all of those people. Because they understood there's only one way for you to get to heaven. It's as if they caught your eye and they said, save yourself from your generation. And the Bible says those people's heart were pricked. And they said, what shall we do? And Peter said, if you're willing to repent of your sins, Jesus will add you to his church. Acts 2 and verse number 47. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Save your souls tonight. Save yourself tonight. Again, Jesus asked a question, what shall a prophet a man? Matthew 16, verse 26. Mark chapter 8, verse 26 and 27, what shall a profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his soul? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? There is nothing on earth that is worth you giving your soul up for. And Peter says you do whatever you have to do to protect your soul from that. If you're not a child of God tonight, again, the Bible, uh, the Bible so clearly teaches that you can become a child of God anytime you want to. Paul says in Romans 10, 17, so, with the, so faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Being willing to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, Hebrews 11, and verse 6. Again, John 14, verse 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. Be willing to repent of your sins, Luke 13, 3 and 5. Confess, Romans 10, 9 and 10, that Jesus is Lord. And upon that confession, being baptized for the remission of your sins. And for those of us who are members of the body of Christ, again, the Bible talks about God is willing uh, that all men should come to repent in 2 Peter 3, verse 9. Uh, God is not willing that anyone should be lost. And thus God, again, is saying, save yourselves from your generation. If we can help you tonight, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.